Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much to Glenn for introducing this panel. Um, we have, uh, I can't think of actually better people to discuss the state of the economy. We're really lucky to have uh, Paul Krugman and Senator Brown. Senator Brown, I'm going to start off with you to get us uh, right into this. Last year, you released a paper called Working Too Hard for Too Little. In it, you, are, you're, are, you argue that hard work isn't valued, and you outline several ideas for how to make hard work pay off. On the day you rolled out the plan, you said, we need to change the way we think about the American economy. What did you mean by that, and what were some of the ideas? Well, for, for a number of years, we've seen, uh, we've seen corporate profits go up. We've seen executive compensation explode. Uh, we've seen productivity go up, and workers' wages have been flat. Uh, workers' wages are flat. Uh, benefits uh, have been scaled back, whether it's retirement or health care benefits. As, as those profits jump. I mean, look at, mm -hmm. look at Humana Corporation. Humana, not too long ago, laid off 3,000 workers, uh, all in the name of cutting costs, cutting costs, cutting costs. That's become, the, that's become the, the definition of corporate success, always shifting, shifting costs onto the workforce by, by cutting, cutting benefits, cutting costs, or, or laying off workers. The Humana CEO got a a raise from $10 million to $20 million. And it, you simply can't, we, we have to quit gauging the economy on corporate success, on, on Wall Street success, on stock market going up. Instead, it's only whose side are you on? Are you on the side of Wall Street or are you on the side of, are you, are you, are you fighting for the little guy? And the little guy, whether, whether, she, uh, whether, the, whether she is, um, uh, works in a diner, whether he works in an office, whether she's punching a time clock, whether he works construction. And uh, we, we don't see the, we don't define the economic success of a growing middle class. We define economic success by Wall Street success. Great. Professor Kogren, I'd like to ask you a follow-up to that. I think what Senator Brown is really referencing is that uh, companies often look at workers as just a cost, not an investment. And I think a lot of people think that that wasn't always the case. Decades ago, uh, companies thought of how to treat not just shareholders, but workers, consumers, uh, their broader community. Do you have thoughts on how that switch was made and how we could, what we could do to switch it back? Um, so it definitely is true. When we used to, people used to write books about the corporation where they would say that a corporation is a, is a collection of stakeholders, which would include the workers, would include to some extent the customers, uh, would include the stockholders, but it wasn't all just about maximizing the stock price. Um, and I think if you want to ask what changed, um, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a change in the political climate, it's a change in the balance of power. One of the reasons corporations used to feel that they needed to treat workers as stakeholders was that there were strong unions, mm -hmm. and even companies that did not themselves have a strong union worried that they might get one if they, if they treated their workers too badly. Um, there used to be an environment where the, where the signals from Washington were don't be too greedy. Now the signals from Washington have been basically be as greedy as possible. <laughs> uh, so they, you know, oh, and I, I just want to say we we are pretty. There's been an overwhelming accumulation of economic evidence now, serious, you know, serious research that says that wages are not like the price of wheat. Uh, mm -hmm. Wages are not like a commodity whose price is is driven by market forces and uh, with which you dare not meddle. Uh, because you'll be punished by the wrath of the invisible hand. Mm -hmm. Wages are about people. Uh, labor markets are highly, are, are, you know, there's, there's a very imperfect competition. There's a lot of market power on the, on the, on the behalf of workers, uh, sorry, on the, on the part of employers. Um, there's a lot that you can do by public policy, whether it's higher minimum wages, uh, strengthening labor's bargaining power that can raise wages without uh, adverse economic consequences, in fact, with positive economic consequences. And that's where we ought to be going. Yeah. A, a recent, recent survey showed that 78% of executives uh, were, said they would be willing to compromise or jeopardize the long-term health of their corporation mm -hmm. um, if it meant meeting short-term quarterly of finance goals, mm -hmm. uh, profits, and that 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 tells you so much about the way they look at things. I mean, look at look at what's happened in this country with with in, in, in any almost any large large corporation, almost any large office building in this country. You will see companies typically have outsourced outsourced to other companies. They've outsourced 
uh, security people, they've outsourced custodial, custodial work, and they've outsourced um, food service. So those workers no longer work for the big companies, they work for an outsourced company mm -hmm. where, where, which doesn't have a consumer brand in any way. They might make in eight, 10, $12 an hour. And what's interesting about that is we subsidize those workers at we, we, we should help those workers as, as a nation, as a Congress, as a government. We subsidize them with, with food stamps and with mm -hmm. Section 8 housing and with Medicaid and with the earned income tax credit. I, I will fight to the last to keep doing that. Of course we should. But um, that's why I, one, of the, one of the tax bills I introduced some time ago was the last year was, was, some, uh, was to um, call the corporate freeloader fee. If a company, <laughs> you know, on the one hand, if a company does the right thing, pays good wages, uh, provides good benefits, keeps their production in this country, uh, under the Patriot Corporation Act, they should get, a, they should get mm -hmm. a lower tax rate. But if they pay low wages and taxpayers end up subsidizing mm -hmm. their low wages, they should pay a corporate freeloader fee. I mean, that, that's where government can be on the side yeah. of workers and on the side of building the middle class. I think, uh, it, just to build off that and, and to ask you, Pro Professor Krugman, I think that a lot of, we've done a lot of research into this issue of uh, sort of short-termism. And, and we've even seen evidence that when companies raise wages, uh, Wall Street punishes those companies when they've raised wages. When Walmart raised wages, uh, they saw a big shock to their stock price. So I think even companies that are trying to do the right thing by raising wages and CEOs who are trying to do the right thing by investing in folks often see that Wall Street is pushing against them because, again, at the, as Senator Brown said at the beginning, people, you know, about Wall Street evaluates workers as just a pure cost, not an investment. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, first of all, it, uh, I think in, in some ways saying that what we need is a change in management psychology is, and, and that Wall Street is the problem, um, it, to some extent it may even be true that paying higher wages is going to hurt a company in the long run unless you have an environment created by politics, by, you know, by, yeah, by policy in which it actually helps them in the long run. Now it's also true, it looks as if um, there was, there's been a kind of an epidemic of companies um, believing that being cruel to their, you know, that basically being vicious to their workforce must be a good thing in the teeth of the evidence. Mm -hmm. So there's a fair bit of evidence that, you know, th the famous comparison was Costco Walmart. There's a fair bit of evidence that they're actually uh, uh, raising wages, um, providing better working conditions up to a point actually is in, your, is in your interests, but nobody on Wall Street, nobody in modern corporate America will believe it. So that's one, just one of, I, I think the point is there's many fronts on which you can be operating here. And, and one of them is, yeah, try to, to end this, this pressure for quarterly, quarterly earnings results, but, but it's only one of many. And they, they, mm -hmm. we should be doing basically everything we can. And there's every reason to believe that fairly unintrusive in the, in the end, fairly unintrusive public policy can make a huge difference to wages. But you, and you, and you haven't had, and you've had a government that's hostile to all that. You've had a government that's, that's if it's not raised the minimum wage in 10 years, you have a government that, that is now the Trump administration is trying to scale back the overtime rule. The, when um, President, Vice President Biden and Secretary President, I flew to Columbus, Ohio to announce the overtime rule um, in I think summer of 2016, it would have meant in my state alone, 130,000 workers would have gotten a raise. Mm -hmm. Workers who are making 35,000 a year are classified as supervisory and then they make them work 50 or mm -hmm. 60 hours with no overtime pay. We would, have, we would have raised those standards in a way that many people would, would have had um, significant raises. We have a government that's hostile to um, the middle class in terms of the tax policy, which Paul has written about so well over the last um, couple of years, well, over the last year, especially when you have, an, you have a government that, that has set up a construct where you shut down production in Mansfield or Toledo, Ohio, and move, move it overseas, and you get a tax break. And that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons that the sort of the cascading of companies has done that. So all of those together is set up a government that's, that really does sort of, is, is hostile to middle class interests. Just wanted to follow up on the tax plan. Uh, I think one of the theories of Republicans is that it would boost wages, lowering corporate taxes would really boost wages. We've seen a lot of information about how it's actually boosting share, backs, uh, share buybacks. Would you like to just talk about how you see the tax plan in connection to this big question about raising wages? Yeah. So there, um, uh, let, me, let me say something good. There is actually a coherent story 
about how this tax plan could raise wages in the long run. And that's exceptional, because very few of the policies that, that come out of, um, out of these people uh, may uh, have any possible coherent story behind them. Um, it's not they, exactly the most efficient way to get dollars but, to workers, though. Yes, yeah, absolutely. but the, the point being, I mean, you're the a, economist. But. It's a coherent story, but it happens to not be true. Uh, um, and, I mean, there's probably some. They're, they're, they're probably going in, in the very long run, we'll probably have a little bit more investment, a little bit more capital stock, and slightly higher wages than we would other things equal without this tax plan. But the long run is very long, and in the meantime, first of all, even, even in the long run, almost surely a lot of it is just going to go to higher profits, uh, especially higher profits from monopolies, because we have a lot of monopoly power in this economy. Um, and it takes, it's going to take decades for those benefits such as they are to manifest. And in the meantime, it's big benefits to, uh, to stockholders, big benefits to management, um, and starving the budget creating fiscal pressure to cut back on all the other good things we should be doing. So it's an extraordinarily bad tax plan. And, uh, you know, when we started out on this discussion, there was some discussion of actual corporate tax reform, mm -hmm. uh, which would have meant possibly lowering the top rate but closing <coughs> loopholes so that the whole thing would be revenue neutral or revenue positive. All of that <laughs> went out the window. All the loopholes are still there. We created new loopholes and um, it, uh, amazingly, uh, of course, th I mean, the one that benefit of all this is we've now seen it and that uh, nobody can now with a straight face say that any of these people care anything about the deficit. <laughs> and, and it was also predictable. I, uh, I read the Wall Street Journal for 25 years. Uh, they hate deficits when there's a Democratic president, but when there's a Republican president, we'll grow out of those deficits. And it, it was so predictable in this way what happened. that The day that, um, that Gary Cohn and uh, Secretary Mnuchin laid out their one or two page tax bill, you remember that back about mm -hmm. a year ago, and they, um, the same day Martin Feldstein, the former Reagan advisor, kind of guru of supply side economics, had an op-ed piece in the, in the Wall Street Journal. He said, you know, don't, don't believe it when they say you can grow your way out of these tax cuts entirely. They said, what we'll need to do, though, is, um, is uh, reform, always the word they use, <laughs> entitlements, always the word they use. And what that meant was raise the eligibility age for Social Security and Medicare. And it didn't take Paul Ryan more than a few hours after the bill was signed uh, to, to begin to talk about that. He, 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 he stepped back when McConnell realized quickly this was going to hurt Republicans' chances to hold the Senate, that you don't really want to do that as a party so quickly. But it's all that, that's, that's the movie they run over and over. They do tax cuts for the rich. We know up to uh, roughly over, over the period of this tax cut, 80% of the benefits go to the richest 1%. We know this will encourage more than discourage more outsourcing of jobs. And we know it puts Congress in a position where, well, we've got to do something about the deficit. In my state, that means eliminating the $400 million we spend to keep the Great Lakes clean. Mm -hmm. uh, it means eliminating the Appalachian Regional Commission. It means going after Medicare and Social Security. So it, it's give more to the wealthiest people in this country and stick it to working families again and again and again from all, from all different directions. I, I want to ask you both a question. I'll start off with you, Professor Krugman, which is, um, I think, as Glenn mentioned, uh, we basically have a dichotomy in the economy, which is we have, we've experienced over 10 years of rebound uh, and growth rates, um, and obviously a lot of uh, growth at the higher end. Uh, we've seen wage stagnation, particularly for people who ha don't have a college degree, but I've seen a, a fair amount of wage stagnation. Um, uh, I'll start with you, Professor Krugman, but then obviously we'd love your views. Senator Brown, you're in Ohio, a state that has uh, shifted a lot politically and where those issues have been front and center um, with plant closings and outsourcing. Uh, so I'd love your views on what, we could, what are the affirmative steps we could take uh, to address the challenge we're seeing, which is, uh, you know, it feels like people without a college degree are kind of bearing the brunt of the economic change that we've been experiencing over the last few decades. Uh, so let's, um, let me point out that actually even people with a college degree ain't doing so great. I mean, the, yeah. the days when we could say that, that, that inequality was about a growing gap based on education are long behind us. Uh, I like to say that um, uh, 
um, high school teachers and private equity managers have about the same number of years of education. They've not exactly <laughs> had the same trajectory of incomes over, over this past generation. So it, it, it's, it's a much deeper phenomenon than just education. But yes, uh, those without a college degree are, are hit even worse by all of this. Um, th there's, two, there's two fronts on which you can operate, both of which are quite broad fronts. One of which is to say that even if your wage is not great, there are certain things you as an American citizen ought to have like guaranteed health care, mm -hmm. like uh, a guaranteed uh, decent retirement, uh, like you know, uh, certain basic things that, by the way, every other advanced country manages to provide. So um, there, there's, there's absolutely no reason not to be providing um, a floor, a social safety net, in, in the real sense, something that if things go bad, uh, it keeps you from, from hitting the ground. Um, and we can, there's lots more we can and should be doing on that. And there are very, I mean, we actually made substantial progress during the Obama years, but not, not all the way, and, and there are excellent plans out there uh, for, to do more on that. The other thing, and this is in the jargon of where I am, we talk about redistribution versus pre-distribution. Um, there's clearly a lot you can do on, on, on raising wages. I mean, we, we have, as it turns out, we have, I'm sorry, I'm gonna sound like a professor here, we have a lot of natural experiments on the minimum wage. Because, we're a think tank. It's okay to be a professor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> where you know, where, where individual states raise the minimum wage and the neighboring states don't, uh, yeah. and we get to see what happens in neighboring counties, and we have a very clear estimate: of how many jobs does it cost to raise the minimum wage? And the answer is zero. There, within uh, you know, at, at, I mean, everybody agrees. If you've tried to have a thirty-five dollar an hour minimum wage, we'd have some problems. But within the range we see in the United States, raising the minimum wages is all gained, no pain. It's a, it's, a, it's a very good policy. There's now very strong evidence that unions um, mm -hmm. have a very positive effect on, um, on wages and particularly on wages of less well-paid workers. Um, we've had policies that uh, our minimum wage in real terms is, is lower than it was in the 1960s. Uh, so we have lots of room, to, uh, of course unions, we know about that, and, and all of that is political. So there's a lot of ways in which a, a political system that cared about workers can move us, maybe you know, there are still probably some headwinds from technology and trade, but there's a lot we can do, even, even with that, to make things much better for the American worker. Yeah, no, I would, I, I agree with all that. I, I, I think we need to talk about work differently. I mean, some, mm -hmm. some people on the coast call my state the Rust Belt, and that diminishes who mm -hmm. we are, and it demeans yeah. what we do. And I think that people in Ohio, I mean, I, Trump won my state by almost nine points. Uh, he won communities he had no business winning with what he was going to do, this assault on workers, assault on the middle class, rolling back all kinds of gains that we've made. But I don't think that, I think workers in my state are, are looking for somebody in elective office to talk about the dignity of work, to talk about whose side are you on, to talk mm -hmm. about um, why work matters no matter what they do. Again, whether, whether she punches a time clock or whether she works in a diner or whether he works in an office or works construction. And uh, I, I don't hear that enough from elected officials. I, I think that workers in my state um, in many ways know that this president is not on their side, although he's talked a good game. And it's my job to show that I am. And, Again, that's, that's a higher minimum wage. It's stronger unionism, and it means, uh, it means when, uh, when labor's in the middle of an organizing drive, I show up at a picket line, or I, I send a letter to the potential bargaining unit, or I call management and say, can you do card check neutrality? Um, it's doing things like that, showing that, saying you're on their side and showing you're on their side. And I just don't think, I don't think workers who have seen their wages decline, and Paul's right, it's not just it's not just blue collar workers, it's also people, and it's not just people with, with, uh, without a four year degree, it's people with two years degrees, it's even people with four year degrees that are in jobs that, that simply don't pay what the value of work should suggest they pay. But I, I think if we start, and we, we've gotta win elections to do all these things, <laughs> I understand, and, but if we start treating work the way it should be treated with the dignity that we all, that, I mean, some of, some of the best, I, I, I was given a book recently by Kamala Harris I had spoken on Martin Luther King Day uh, using talking the quote, Martin Luther King has a wonderful quote about street sweepers saying that street sweepers sweep streets the way Michelangelo paints and the way that Beethoven writes music. 
And um, we talked about, I, it was the day after Dr. King's birthday celebration, I was on the floor with Kamala, and she, I had this book by, that he gave, she gave me by a guy named Michael Honey about King's speeches about work. And King believed that the labor movement and the civil rights movement should walk hand in hand. Uh, and you know, he didn't have cooperation from every international labor president, but he had more than um, some interesting, I won't go into all the details there, but, but the point is that, that if we're gonna be a progressive movement and it's about civil rights and human rights, it's also about worker rights and it's also about trade unionism and it's about raising wages and giving workers regardless of race. I don't talk about Clinton voters or Trump voters. I don't talk about white workers and black workers and Latino workers. I talk about workers and I talk about voters and I think that's the way mm -hmm. that you sell that message and we do that, we're gonna have some wins in 2018 it will surprise people. Did you want to add something to that, Professor uh, Krugman? Yeah, let me, uh, I, I think you know, we need, we need um, there is a, a prejudice which I think is shared by a, a lot of people, which is that, that work only means manufacturing jobs and, uh, or coal mining yeah. jobs. And, yeah. and while we certainly should do what we can, to, uh, to, to keep those jobs where, where they can and make sure they pay decently. Work means any kind of work. Uh, the, uh, it, it means, you know, uh, I, I, should, I think a very important political development is people, I think, are starting to realize that when they talk about let's get rid of big government and, and um, mm -hmm. slash government, at least at the state and local level, government is basically school teachers. And, it's, and, uh, and what's been striking to me is how, how, much, how broad the, the public support has been for these teacher uh, strikes, that, that people mm -hmm. are starting to realize, oh, you know, that, that, that man or woman teaching my children is actually a worker, and when, I, when somebody campaigns against government, it's actually about hurting them. And by the way, they're, 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 those are wages that really have stagnated uh, just as badly as blue-collar wages. Um, and that if we actually, you know, what is the typical American worker now? It's no longer an assembly line manufacturing worker. If you had to have an image of who is an American worker now, you would basically say a nurse. Uh, <laughs> it, it's someone, that, it's healthcare. I mean, I, I, it drives me crazy sometimes when we talk about some place like West Virginia, where they, yeah, there are 3% of the workforce is in mining, 15% are in healthcare and, and social assistance. And you know who pays for that? Um, it's, it's, you know, big government pays for that, and sh as it should. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we, we, need to, we need, I think, a more inclusive view, view about who are the workers in America, and we should be out there to support all of them. And just, uh, we'll have to wrap up soon, but I wanted to just build on, on a thing, things both of you have discussed, which is essentially how, I think we're all trying to think through how we can ensure this economy and the growth we have is more broadly shared. Um, and I guess I would love your closing thoughts. Uh, we've talked about the minimum wage. We've talked about uh, a whole array of issues. Uh, we had a president who campaigned on really helping working class people. The agenda he's put forward has been a little bit at odds, at least in some areas, the tax plan, the attack on overtime, the attack on uh, NLRB and other issues. But so, you know, if you could just summarize ideas that you have to actually redress the kind of wage stagnation we've seen, and actually provide dignity in work. One of the fascinating things is there was a lot of talk about an infrastructure bill, no effort by the Republican Congress to actually pass that infrastructure bill. Are there investments we should be making that would actually uh, boost the wages of people, but also at the end of the day make our economy work better for more people? Yeah, surely. Um, and you start with an infrastructure bill, you're right. I mean, the Democrats, have, I mean, people all the time at home say, uh, you know, how come you're not offering alternatives? And I say, well, we are. I mean, I, five senators, including, uh, I was one of five Democrats that offered a trillion dollar infrastructure bill paid for that would actually mm -hmm. uh, deal with water and sewer and broadband in rural areas. I met a young woman, I mean, a high school, uh, high school kid once, a few, a few months ago that, in, in, that lives in Appalachia in Southeast Ohio in the area Paul was talking about. And, she, um, she has, she lives, she, she said when she studies, she has to go to her grandmother's house. She lives in a valley, her grandmother lives on top of a hill, and so she just can't get good internet access mm. where she lives. Um, that's, part of, that's part of infrastructure, that's part of rural development. And we don't, you know, we don't speak, we don't speak to small town America, we don't speak, we don't speak to workers. And I just think so much of this from infrastructure to wages uh, to tax policy, uh, it's pretty, the past pretty clear in my mind 
um, having the votes to do it. Uh, we're not there yet. We very much can be. Professor Krugman? Yeah. Um, actually, it, it's, uh, some people have put together a list. There were, there were five basic Trump uh, populist promises <laughs> during the campaign, and he has now broken all of them, which actually kind of offers an opportunity because there's a, a chance once again to say, look, here's, here we are going to do real stuff, and it includes uh, health care. Health care has been a huge, uh, polling suggests it's been the biggest issue in the special yeah. elections so, so far. far. Um, infrastructure spending, yeah. Um, I told, <laughs> it was obvious from the beginning there would be no infrastructure mm -hmm. plan, and the, the needs are huge. The, and they're, there and needed that money for the tax cut. That's right. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, um, I think regional policies. So CAP has a new uh, mm -hmm. paper that, among other things, addresses that. And that there, there's a, there's a, a lot of, of reason to believe now that aid to distressed regions, uh, one way or another, largely through infrastructure spending, but also through some job guarantees, is a mm -hmm. really good idea. And it's something that that we can offer uh, as a uh, an improvement on 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 the way things are. Um, I would actually, I know we're out of time, but uh, let me just say yeah, that please. people who say that, you know, we, we can't do that, we, they can't. actually, uh, we used to have a, a, what amounted to a very strong regional development uh, program um, to help uh, lagging regions. It was called the defense budget. And if you actually <laughs> ask, you know, why, why, did, why did the South converge so much? Why did lagging regions of the U.S. converge so much? Uh, for a generation after World War II on advanced regions, a lot of it had to do with defense spending, and then that kind of went away, and uh, we need something to replace it. And uh, so, th th I'm, I think there, there is, look, um, uh, I, we always have problems in America when we talk about foreign countries, because they've, you know, we don't, we don't ever believe we can <laughs> lean or learn anything from them. But we can. We, uh, every, every country does some things well and some things badly. But we can look at countries like Denmark, uh, famously, uh, uh, Senator Sanders brought that up, but it's a, good, it's a good model. And Denmark does both ends of it. They have a much more equal distribution of wages than we do, largely because their workforce is two-thirds unionized. <laughs> um, and they also have a much stronger social safety net than we do. And the result is there's just vastly less misery in Denmark <laughs> than there is here. Working people lead decent lives, even though they face the same forces of technology and globalization that we do. And it means calling out the president when he when he's fighting now for a Chinese company that's broken international <laughs> law. And at the same time, he won't stand up to with when the president, the, the CEO of GM's in his office and he goes to Ohio, he won't stand up for 1,500 laid off, possibly permanently laid off workers in Youngstown after GM's gotten billions of dollars in tax cuts. And that, that, I think you call the president out for that kind of hypocrisy. That Trump organization deal with, with the Chinese in <laughs> Indonesia had nothing to whatsoever nothing. to do with this. <laughs> <laughs> We could, uh, we, could, we could talk about that for another time, but that actually leads very well into our rule of law and democracy panel, which is next. Thank you both Thank very you. much for the discussion and all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.